Hey everybody, I'm Tarl Yarber with Fixated Real Estate. I'm here in Tacoma, Washington, and I'm gonna show you guys this house here that we just got done fixing up and literally just sold it as well, and how we bought the property, all the numbers involved into it, especially the rehab, and how we messed this property up so that you can learn from my mistakes. There's a lot of issues that went on with this property, things that I think a newbie would have had issues with for sure, yet I'm a veteran in this business and we still messed it up. So the purpose of this video, guys, today is not just to show you all the rehab issues, all the challenges, that we went through on this project, but also hopefully give you hope that no matter how good you are at this business, you can still mess it up. So let's get into this property right now. So let's go over this property really quick. And before we do that, check out a video we did. We did a full before walkthrough of this property when we bought this house many, many months ago. It's on the Bigger Pockets YouTube channel. Great video, went through the whole thing. You can see how totally messed up this property was. This whole area was just a big, huge, massive landscape hazard issue growing on top of the house. The thing was falling apart. We got it at a steep discount as well, which is one of the best ways to flip properties or even do burrs, buy, rehab, rent, refinance, repeat, is buy really, really, really messed up properties like this one was, fix it all up and hopefully sell it for a profit or refinance finance it and rent it out to an end tenant. So check out that video when we went through it. You'll see how nasty it was. And when we go through this property here in a second as well, you're gonna see some before photos and some things we're gonna show you popping up on the screen. But I wanna jump into the numbers briefly on this property. So let's go over that real quick. So we bought this property for $175,000 many, many, many months ago. Now, in all aspects, we were like, this is gonna be done and out of this property in six months or less, probably four months, six months, if worst case scenario. We're at month 11, so that's step number one of our issues that we're gonna go over to today on this property. How did we go over project schedule by five full months? So we bought it for 175. We also budgeted, I believe, around $85,000 for this project. Now, this is a small house. It's a three bedroom, one bath house that we left the same way as a three bedroom, one bath, but we completely updated the property with all electrical, plumbing, roofing, everything it was so messed up. And we budgeted $85,000 to do that, yet we came under budget joking, at $118,000. So how did we go over budget by what? $32,000 on this project. I'm gonna show you how we did that as well so that you can learn from our mistakes and hopefully not make the same problems that we did on this project. So we're gonna jump into that. But luckily we sold it for $425,000 and made up for those mistakes. So the market helped us out a lot. We still would have made money on this deal if we sold it for our original projections, but we made some money. We're gonna come out of this happily and we're gonna look like geniuses despite all the screw ups that we did on this property. So let's go check it out. So come on in. Now, as you guys can see from the before photos and video that this place is completely different, completely transformed than it was prior to us finishing it up now. So you, what some things you cannot tell on this project right walking in was that in the before video, this place was topsy-turvy all over the place. One of the problems with buying properties uh, that are lived in, and we, this property was lived in when we purchased it, is sometimes they have a lot of furniture, a lot of stuff in the property that you can't really tell sometimes the structural issues that are in the house itself. Now we got this property at such an extreme discount at $175,000 for this neighborhood and in Tacoma, that's really, really cheap right now. Uh, and when you get a property that low, sometimes you have to be able to buy it sight unseen, not get a lot of inspections done on it, and just hope for the best. Now this property, we were able to get inside and check it out a little bit, but we weren't able to get the full inspection that we wanted to on the project. This is a 1928 year built house. So almost a hundred years old. And a lot of stuff can happen on these buildings over the course of almost a hundred years, especially in this neck of the woods. We have water issues, we have settling issues. The fact that a lot of these homes didn't put footings down into their actual foundation structures. So they tend to settle. This particular property, the perimeter foundation around it didn't settle too much, but the interior posts and beams and so forth that were underneath here in the house settled dramatically over the years. A lot of it was really haphazardly put together, made the property tilt in certain areas. It actually up goes uphill in this direction. There used to be a wall as well uh, here that we had to remove because it just makes the kitchen so much better. Just like any episode of HGTV, knock the kitchen wall out and you're gonna make so much more money. So we did that because we watch HGTV, right? Uh, so we do that, we open up the kitchen 
but we had a lot of slanting issues. There's still some slanting issues on this property. Now, one of the benefits about buying almost a 100-year-old house in a neighborhood that has a lot of 100-year-old houses, people are used to properties not being perfectly level in this neighborhood. Now, it's way better than it used to be, but it's almost impossible to make it perfect unless you spend a ton of money with a ton of engineering. So I'll get into some of the ways that we fix that later. Uh, so don't let me forget, but I'm gonna go over that a little bit later in this video. So I'm gonna go over some major pro tips with you guys. I'm gonna go over the issues we had at the foundation, also some issues we had with the city planning uh, that we had on this property for the permits, some of the other delays, some of the other big surprises that we had that hopefully you guys can learn from as well. But I wanna show you guys the rest of the house before we get into that so you get a feel for what we did. Like I said, this before photos and everything, this, part, this was completely closed off. We opened that up to make it a good flow into the property. Uh, we were able to, we, had, we redid this whole nook. We had to do all the electrical, update the appliances, make it really nice, brand new. Not gonna go in there, but that's our washer dryer room. Um, but when we come over here, we have the two bedrooms left and right. We didn't change anything on the floor plan on the downstairs level other than opening up that kitchen, but we did completely update the bathroom here. Just something standard that we do in all of our projects. Uh, you always wanna put your money into the kitchens and the bathrooms as much as possible, update the finishes as much as possible too, to get the highest value. But if you've watched enough of my videos, enough of our projects, you'll see that a lot of these finishes are the same. Right? We don't really change our finishes too much in particular neighborhoods that we work in because if the finishes work, why do we need to change them? Some of us in this business like to use our properties as like a canvas, a piece of art that we can express our artistic creativity through. This is a business to me and my team, so we're, this, this is more of a commodity to us. So we wanna sit there and go like, what works in this neighborhood and let's just get that done and do it over and over again or in this city or in this uh, geographic location or whatever it might be. It saves us a lot of time, energy, and effort picking out finishes, but also saves us a lot of energy and effort uh, on being able to sit there and do the same finishes over and over again so we don't have to think about it. Like these things are pretty simple. This is a Home Depot faucet, and we try to buy things through Home Depot and Lowe's, no affiliation uh, to us, right? But we try to keep things simple because we know it's in stock, it's going to be there, and this is a 30 or $40 faucet that we use all the time. These mirrors, these lights, this tile we've used so many times in our projects. Uh, Serena, who picks all our finishes out, really likes this tile. She even just put it into her own house recently. So uh, I would never put it in my house, but whatever, it's her choice. I don't really make those decisions. <laughs> this is the same $90 toilet we use from Home Depot. This is the same LVP, luxury vinyl planking that we use as well. So we keep things simple for us. It looks clean, it looks great. It makes us, we don't have to think about it more than once. And maybe every now and then, we look at re-updating our finishes. So coming back through here, you can see as well through some of the before photos that when we go up the stairwell, which 100 year old houses, for whatever reason, you had to go through the kitchen to go upstairs uh, back in the day. This whole area here was a mess. Uh, there was moldy, it was nasty, uh, it wasn't well built, it still kind of isn't. But hey, the city of Tacoma signed off on all the permits. It is structurally sound. Uh, we're good to go uh, as far as permits are concerned. But this bedroom here, which the ceiling height isn't that great, but the, uh, this bedroom here was permitted sometime about 40, 50 years ago. Uh, and they built a dormer out to make this what was a attic space. You could tell that this was an attic at some point, and these old houses had these attic spaces all the time. They finished out this attic space, which is why these stairs are so bad and steep and so narrow and not to code if you built them new to today. But they built this dormer here in order to be able to make this a finished living square footage. Now your city might have all sorts of different codes, things you have to go through to be able to finish an attic space like this out legally, but we bought this as this was already set up this way, it just wasn't done the right way. And we redid it all, made sure it was great, and then got the city to sign off on all of it, so now it's official living space. And we did that, and that was one of our hangups early on getting permits on this property. So just because a space, like a basement or an attic or some sort of square footage of an addition, looks like it's to code or looks like, uh, the, like it's finished square footage, it doesn't mean that the city recognizes it as finished square footage. So part of any due diligence on properties, especially older properties in non-conforming areas, such as this area here, uh, you have to do your due diligence when you start seeing a dormer on a finished attic space and whether or not the city's gonna recognize that or not, especially if you plan on getting permits, which you should. So speaking of permits, this leads me to one of the first big issues that we wanna go over on this project, besides the foundation stuff, which we talked about earlier. Permits. 
Now we went into this project and we, we do our own permitting. We submit permits into the city and so forth. And this is a plan set. I'm going to show you on the screen. This is a plan uh, of the floor plan of what this property looked like, right? You can see from the as built that the way that it's broken down to what it looked like when we were just doing the floor plans. We submit these things to the city. It's a before and after. We didn't change the floor plans too much on this, but we have to get some sort of floor plan to the city so they can see, hey, this is what the property looks like before we started. This is what it's going to look like on a floor plan after we're done with the project. So going through all of that um, allows us to submit permits. We have to submit a scope of work, all that stuff. And our city and this city in Tacoma keeps it pretty simple to us. Now, unless some sort of red flag comes up, we submit these permits to the city and the city calls it out. They first, they sit on it for almost an entire month because they were behind in staff because during whatever this wacky time of the world is, uh, staffing is an issue, especially for local governments right now. So during that time period, they sat on it for a month, finally looked at it, and then they kick it back to us, basically saying, hey, it looks like you're finishing the attic space. Uh, when we're not, it was already finished. Uh, therefore, you need to submit a full engineered plan set, get architects involved, blah, 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 make sure it's through code. It's probably an attic, so you're not gonna be able to finish it out, so blank off. That's basically what they're telling us. And of course, that's not the case. There's a, this is where you learn what are your city codes, city ordinances, all that type of stuff. And you sometimes have to really get involved and push back on city professionals and whether or not they're doing the right job and if they even know their own code. That said, we had to go through some issues. We had to reset some plans. We had to go back to them, go back and forth multiple times to prove that this was finished space already, how it was grandfathered in. In fact, I had to go through the archives in the city of Tacoma to show that this was permitted at one point in the 50s to be able to prove that we did not, we weren't the ones that actually were finishing this space out. I've never had that issue before in this city. They usually they do all that stuff themselves, but hey, budget crisis or whatever, or uh, I don't know, um, people working in the county right now, or city right now, they just didn't want to do that work, so we had to do it for them. That set us back almost three full months of back and forth, got me to a point to where I had a deal with going straight to the uh, supervisors themselves more than once, and at that point, finally, they crossed over and realized they were making a mistake. But hey, what do they do? They say, oh, sorry, we're bad, here's your permit. And we cost you a whole bunch of money on holding costs and time, but that's your problem, not ours. So. Step one on our permit on our on our delays is almost three months due to permit issues on this particular simple project. So if I have any advice for you guys on that is that it doesn't matter how perfectly you planned out your project, uh, there's always going to be some sort of issue that can come up. You can be an expert in this business, you can be doing hundreds of deals, I've done hundreds and hundreds of deals uh, in this real estate business, and yet when it comes to construction, something can always come up. And you have to be adaptive, not get too upset about that type of stuff and work through it because the problem's there and you got to solve it. You got to deal with what is, not with what isn't. It should have been differently, but it wasn't different. So you have to not should all over yourself uh, and we will just get things done, which we did. So we persevere. Now, here we go. Let's go. Let's get out of here because I don't like being up here anyways. Now that we're out of there, let's get into one of our second issues that we had on this property, which I brought up earlier. That was the foundation and all the settling that came into this house. Right, so once we started breaking into this property and we started removing and demoing things out, we realized really fast that not only was there settling, which we were aware of settling, we just didn't know how extreme it was because we didn't have access to it uh, until after we purchased the property. So once we got into this thing, we realized that most of the posts and piers down below in this crawl space, which we could show you some photos, were rotted out, sunk through, had no footings on them, resting on dirt, uh, and we had a lot of settling and challenges in the crawl space itself, just not only with the post and piers, but the joist too. So once we started digging into those, we also found out that a lot of the subfloor here was rotted out. We had the entire, we had to replace almost all the subfloor of the washer drying area and all the subfloor of the bathroom area. A lot of the joists were rotted from just years and years and years of water issues that were building up over time, which might've been one of the causes of the settling to begin with. So we had to spend way more money than we originally planned and budgeted on that and we had to do it twice. So let me explain that. So our first contractor that comes in, you have one main load bearing beam wall here that also is the post. We replace all those things, figure that all stuff out, put almost all new post and piers and uh, footings down below, stabilize the property. Now, one of the challenges with jacking the property up though, right, is that if we not just stabilize it and stop it from settling more, we also need to level it out. Now, if this is an old house, 
that maybe over the course of 100 years has settled, a lot of repairs have been done over 100 years too because of the settling, either from door jams or, or lath and plaster. A lot of this is lath and plaster, not drywall. It starts to get repaired over years and years and years. So if we take a house that's sunk two, three, four inches and jack it all up at once, right, to level it out, it's going to crack, pop, snap, so much stuff in the property. So we can only level it out so much without causing a lot of other damage, such as the windows getting out of plumb, doors, door jams getting all messed up, lath and plaster cracking everywhere. So we have to balance that and go like, how far do we jack this thing up? So once we had it as fixed as we thought we could without doing too much damage and then setting it back in a spot, we get back to work on it and we realize that we had some other issues like this big issue here that was much higher than the rest of the house. This here, we have no idea how that happened. We still don't know why this area and this area upheaves compared to the rest of the property. It's almost like the rest of the property sunk and this place was perfect, right? Never moved an inch over the course of hundred years. So we had to go in there and redo this area again later once we were done. We missed that. That was our fault completely uh, based on the construction rehab. You would think after doing as many deals as we did, we wouldn't have missed that, but hey, we did, so it happens sometimes, no matter how perfect we think we are. So we had to break into all that stuff again, pay more contractors, get that all figured out. Of course, get engineers involved to make sure we're doing it right uh, the first time. Now, did that set us back time? Yes, that set us back an additional full month, if not 45 days, going through all the headaches of settling this house out, finding sourcing contractors, dealing all that stuff to begin with. We also, one of the other factors that can happen in this business is if you do too many deals, you run out of contractors. In this particular time space of this project, we didn't have enough people to come work on this job because we had too many other jobs going on at the same time. So we had some time delays, right? So remember when you're scaling in this business, it's not just about buying the houses, it's also about scaling the people around you, the boots on the ground that you need to be able to make this business work. So based on the lessons of the issue with the crawl space and the issue with the selling on this property, which I thought I learned many years ago already, but apparently I didn't, uh, some things you can get out of that. You can't always see everything. It's what's underneath the walls, what's hidden behind the walls, underneath the earth, whatever, or underneath the crawl space or whatever, that can really catch you off guard and give you a lot of change orders and change your budget completely if you're not careful. But this is investing. Right, so remember that one key thing, one other key thing in this business is another key pro tip. When you invest, you're making basically educated guesses. If this was a guaranteed way to make money, then it wouldn't have, one, it wouldn't have as much reward as it really does because most guarantees don't have the biggest payoffs that they can. But in this business, we make educated guesses and we take risks based on that. We took a risk, we bought a property super cheap and we took a risk that our budget was going to stay on point and sell it for a certain amount, right? Now, through that risk, we discovered, we discovered some damage, right? That we had to overcome and, and deal with. So that was the risk we take to do this business. Do your best to mitigate those risks by getting inspections, getting professionals involved and so forth. But when you have an opportunity like we did here to buy a house really cheap, almost sight unseen, those risks go up. So those rewards better be great in order to make it worth the risk. So how do you turn a crap situation like we had in this property and still get out ahead? Well, one, through mitigating risk, we really, really dove into what the after repair value was going to be on this property. Now we did that with such a fine tooth comb that we figured, hey, we have enough buffer on this house despite the fact that we think we're gonna be able to do this for 85,000. If we're off budget on this property, we have enough buffer to not lose money. Now, number one goal in this business is to make lots of money, but the number two goal is don't lose money while you're making money, right? So whenever we buy properties and we analyze our numbers, we say, what's the worst case scenario to make it to where you break even? There was so much buffer on this, on this property that is worth us taking the risk for buying it so cheap, sight unseen, right? To be able to say, if the budget went way over 85,000, it's gonna take a lot before we get down to zero net profit. Now this property sold for 425,000 and even though we went over budget 35,000 roughly, uh, I don't even remember the math right now of talking to you guys, um, we still are going to net over $90,000 net profit on this deal. So despite the fact that there's so much uncertainty still in this world, uh, and right now, who knows where the market's really going to be, right? You could still run your numbers with a sharp, sharp pencil and even use some of the Bigger Pockets tool calculators that are out there. Go to biggerpockets.com and there's so many calculators that they provide that can help you run accurate numbers to be able to invest here in real estate.
There's also so much excitement about the real estate market right now. In many markets today, the market keeps going up and some of you guys might be thinking the market's going to keep going up. Now, it might keep going up for some period of time, but how are you analyzing your deals and how are you finding your deals right now are very, very important things to consider. There's people out there today that are buying real estate and betting on the market to continue to rise. Now, if the market does continue to rise, those guys are gonna look like geniuses, right? We very much have benefited from the market increasing over time. But one day that music might stop and where key fundamentals in this business come to play are what's gonna save investors in the long run. If you buy a property just because you think the market's gonna go up another five or 10% in your area in the next four to six months, which, hey, in this area, it has done that, the day it doesn't do that and you go over budget and have supply issues and have other challenges pop up out of nowhere, that's when the music's gonna stop for you. And I've seen people go through that transition in this business more than once. Short story, in 2018 in Seattle, particularly in the, in the actual Seattle area, market was on fire. But then May, June 2018, our market, at least in the Seattle area and some other parts of the US, ceased, it stopped. Almost all things closing just didn't happen because the market, because the rates went up a little too high that month. I know a number of people that are still recovering from that blip. Now, will that happen today? Who knows, it's all speculation. That's why there's other experts out there to help you figure out what may or may not happen in the market. But stick to key fundamentals in this business and in the long run, you'll be able to protect yourselves and hedge against market fluctuations because I can promise you this, the market is going to go up and the market's going to go down and the market's gonna go up and it's gonna go down. Just don't get caught on a property that you have to sell when the market shifts. But hopefully you make a shit ton of money at the same time, so get after it. Now, finalizing all this business here, how do you find your deals? Make sure you guys go keep door knocking, go cold call, go do whatever you can with wholesalers. This particular property was from a wholesaler that cold calls like crazy and gets up there and talks to people as much as possible, does tons of volume, and they got this deal tied up at such a low price and they brought it to us because we buy from wholesalers. So if you're a wholesaler out there and you got wanna find people like us to be able to sell deals to, and if you're a guy like me, go network with more than one wholesaler or real estate agent that's out there and you can find better deals here. If you're only got talking to one person, then you're failing. You gotta to talk to as many people as possible and get the feelers out there, especially in today's world, to find the best deals. If there's no good deals out there, well, how many are you actually looking at? How many people are you talking to? How many, are you trying to source them yourself? Are you networking with other people? Those are all key fundamentals to how to find the best deals. Go out there and get after it. On that note, I'm gonna end the video right now. So I'm Tarl Yarber with Fixated Real Estate. You can follow me on Instagram, at Tarl Yarber. Make sure you comment, like, subscribe to this video. This is Bigger Pockets. We love comments. We'll answer the questions as best as we can, or other people watching this will answer the questions for you. Make sure you subscribe to this YouTube channel and check us out on the next video, and we'll see you there.